Massachusetts. This is the third in our series of webinars, and we encourage you to view previous ones on our website at www.scleroderma.research.org. Also, it's really important to us that we're delivering the content that you want to hear, both during the webinar, via our monthly e-newsletter, and on our website, where a wealth of information is available. So please, share your thoughts with us by participating in the very short seven-question survey at the close of the meeting, sending a comment via our website, or simply calling our office. We really appreciate your feedback. Of course, we also appreciate your support. Medical research is both time-consuming and expensive. The series here is free, as is all the information on our website. We do not charge a membership fee, so please consider making a donation after today, whether it be online or by calling the office. The SRF does not receive any government funding, so we depend upon your support to advance research and to provide these services for you. We believe the best way to help patients is to fund the most promising research, and we're totally devoted to that. Today's webinar will take a look, if you will, under the hood as we learn about the tools that researchers use in their quest for answers about scleroderma. The webinar is scheduled to last about one hour, and within that time, we'll include about a 15-minute question and answer session at the end. Questions can be asked by using the chat functionality in the conference window. However, please keep in mind that our webinars are for general information purposes and no information provided is to be considered personalized medical advice. That said, we will not be able to answer questions pertaining to personal symptoms or other questions that may not be appropriate for the entire audience. It's wonderful to have all of you with us today, and it's my pleasure to introduce a very talented researcher dedicated to changing the landscape for scleroderma patients. Dr. Tony Aliprontis is Assistant Professor of Medicine in the Rheumatology Division at the Brigham and, Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. Three years ago, he was recruited to the Rheumatology Division of BWH to lead an independent research program where his team pairs mouse genetics with translational human studies to investigate rheumatic diseases, including, of course, scleroderma. Dr. Aliprontis has been working with the Scleroderma Research Foundation since 2006. And along with Dr. Lori Glimsher, he is the recipient of the Foundation's Actillion Research Award, which is made possible from a very generous grant from Actillion Pharmaceuticals. Dr. Aliprontis is also the director of the Osteoarthritis Center at Brigham and, Williams, Brigham and Women's. We welcome him today to present Understanding Scleroderma Research, a look inside the toolbox. Thank you for being here today, Dr. Aliprontis. Please take over. Thank you, Luke. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today with you and with you all to discuss uh, scleroderma research. So let's begin. So outlined here uh, are the objectives of our webinar today. Uh, what I'd like to do is start by reviewing the challenge of scleroderma from both the perspective of the patient as well as the perspective of the researcher, like myself. And we'll spend the majority of our time today discussing, uh, taking a look inside the research toolbox, really to answer the question, how do we as researchers approach the problem of scleroderma? And then as we go along the way, as we're looking in the toolbox, we'll go over examples of how the toolbox has been accessed to give us some uh, interesting insight into uh, the causes of scleroderma and potential uh, therapeutics that could be developed. What I thought I would do today is start uh, with this series of questions, um, really sort of going over why scleroderma is so challenging. And when we think about, a, when we think about diseases and we think about well, you know, what makes a disease easy to treat or e easy to cure, um, we think of a few questions. One, we like to know, you know is the disease Easily is the disease easily recognized? And I think uh, most of the patients in the audience can appreciate that scleroderma is a rare disease. And unfortunately, many physicians, especially, for example, primary care physicians, may have never seen a case. So getting patients to specialists early is often a challenge. Second, uh, we like to know whether or not I'm oh, sorry, I think I may have 
skipped a slide there. So we also like to know if whether there, the diagnosis of scleroderma or whether diagnosis of a disease can be made early and easily. And early on, symptoms of scleroderma often overlap with other diseases. And the diagnosis is mostly clinical. There's not a single test that we can run for a patient that will tell us whether the patient has scleroderma or not. And then as we'll get into, there are multiple subsets of clinical, uh, clinical illnesses that uh, fall into the scleroderma spectrum. And this also makes the disease challenging for the patient really to sort of be categorized into what type of scleroderma they have, as well as for the researcher to try to understand the disease. Well, the other thing we'd like to know when we think about treating disease is the cause known. And unfortunately, right now, we don't know the cause of scleroderma, which is why we're all working uh, so hard uh, to do our research in this disease. And of course, um, the multiple disease subsets makes uh, the question of what is the cause of scleroderma more challenging because are all the different disease subsets the same? And of course, when we're thinking about treating a disease, we like to know um, if there is a um, if there's a treatment and uh, if there's a treatment available. Well, oftentimes without the cause or causes. Uh, it's hard to know what the right treatment for a disease is. And again, the multiple disease subsets, uh, should we treat all patients the same or is every patient unique and needs to be have, a, have a treatment tailored uh, for them particularly? So we know that he uh, scleroderma is what we call a heterogeneous disease. And essentially what that word means is that there are different types of it. There is a diffuse type of scleroderma a limited type of scleroderma, as well as a localized form called morphia that just involves the skin. And let's go through quickly these three different subtypes because it'll come, become important later on in the talk to understand how some of the research is done. So diffuse scleroderma is a disease that uh, can affect basically almost every organ or any organ in the body, uh, but each patient is unique and has a different constellation of symptoms. Most classically, patients will all ha almost all have Raynaud's phenomenon, as well as fibrosis here shown in the skin, uh, but also can involve uh, the, proximal, uh, the proximal skin, the upper arms, the legs, as well as the trunk and face. Many patients will also experience inflammation and fibrosis or scar tissue formation in their lungs. And uh, it can involve the GI tract from the esophagus all the way to the intestines, as well as the kidneys and heart. A second form of scleroderma called limited scleroderma will often, will, will also, is also characterized by Raynaud's phenomenon, uh, as well as skin fibrosis, but mostly involves the hands or the feet with less involvement of the upper arms, legs, and trunk. Some patients will, often de will also develop deposits of calcium in their skin, and these patients will get blood vessel abnormalities, sometimes of the uh, pulmonary arteries, the arteries leading from the heart into the lungs. Lastly, there is a, a form of scleroderma called morphia that just affects the skin. And pathologically, it looks fairly similar to if you did a skin biopsy, for example, in a patient with a localized uh, scleroderma, the skin biopsy would look similar. However, these patients don't develop any internal organ involvement and only have an affected area of skin. So these multiple disease subsets make scleroderma a challenge from the researcher's perspective because we don't know whether or not to study one disease subset or all of them. Well, all patients are affected, and I think we'd like to study all of them and, be, and understand all of them so we can help as many patients as possible. Furthermore, many organ systems can be involved in, in any given patient, uh, especially with diffuse scleroderma and limited scleroderma. Uh, there are the, uh, the plethora of organ systems that can be involved makes every patient uh, a unique case. So how can we rise to the challenge of scleroderma? Well, I think uh, being a, such a compl complex problem, we really need to tackle this problem from multiple angles and employ multiple tools. 
and not just employ multiple tools, but really employ the latest technology, which is what I will try to expose you to today. I think uh, as researchers we need to keep an open mind. Uh, we can't sort of take the approach that it's my way or the highway, and we need to uh, always be open to new ideas. And then as uh, I think the Scleroderma Research Foundation has been very um, supportive of, uh, we need to collaborate. In other words, people from different, uh, investigators from different disciplines really need to get together to uh, tackle this problem with the latest technology from the different uh, angles that they have their respective expertise in. So let's start opening the toolbox and uh, discuss three ways in which we can study a complex disease. And what we will review today are three different uh, modern tools of, of uh, biomedical research. Uh, the first is uh, genetics, which has really exploded in the last 10 years. Uh, the second tool is what we call gene expression analysis. And the third tool are animal models of disease. So the first tool we'll, we're going to tackle is genetics. So essentially, what is genetics? Genetics is the study of our genes. And the question I think that will come to many of your mind, minds is exactly what is a gene? And so let me take a step back and make sure everyone is on the same page. So what is a gene? So genes are encoded in our DNA, and I think we've all heard that term DNA. DNA stands for uh, deoxyribose nucleic acid. And that big long term uh, really uh, you don't need to remember. But essentially, um, what I think you need to understand is that uh, DNA uh, is a, um, essentially a code for the generation of all of the proteins in our body. So cells in our body need proteins to execute the unique functions of those particular cells or tissues. So for example, the skin in our bodies has a lot of collagen, and it's overproduction of collagen in scleroderma that gives the skin its hard feel. Red blood cells are another example of cells that make a particular protein. They make a protein called hemoglobin, which I will uh, talk about later as an example of a protein that's important in our bodies. And those Hemoglobin carries oxygen around the body and allows red blood cells in our blood system to carry oxygen throughout, the, throughout our body. So how do the cells in our body know how to make these particular proteins? Well, that information is encoded in our DNA. And the way the DNA goes from being, from the way the information goes from being DNA into a protein is through a process that's called initially transcription. So the cells in our body make a copy of a segment of this DNA into an RNA copy by a process called transcription. Then the cells take the RNA and interpret that into and use that as a template to make the different proteins. So when we talk about one gene, we're essentially talking about the information that's coded in our DNA that allows our cells to make a single protein. The other point to uh, appreciate is that the DNA uh, has, uh, our DNA from person to person all have different uh, mutations or there's small differences in our genetic code. And when these changes in our DNA occur within genes, that can change the function of that particular protein. So an example that perhaps uh, people have heard of before uh, is a genetic disease called uh, sickle cell anemia, where a mutation occurs in the gene for hemoglobin, which causes the hemoglobin to behave abnormally. And that's just an example of how understanding how a change in the DNA can lead to a change in a protein. So one question we need to think about when we think about genetics is, is scleroderma actually a genetic disease? And the answer to that question is both yes and no. So we know that there's an increased prevalence of scleroderma in first-degree relatives of patients who have scleroderma. Uh, 
However, it's certainly by no means a one-to-one -one, uh, phenomenon. In other words, if you have a first-degree relative with, with a scleroderma, your risk of developing the disease is quite small, only about 2%, but that's much higher than the general population. So an absolute risk is small, but the relative risk is high. Identical twins, so if you have an identical twin that has uh, scleroderma, your risk is higher than the general population. And it also has been noted that people of Choctaw Indian background have an increased risk of scleroderma. However, there's no single gene, no single gene encoding a single protein that causes scleroderma. And multiple genes likely contribute. There are, of course, other very important risk factors that have not been well-defined, including perhaps uh, things in the environment or previous infections. So how do we determine the genes that put individuals at risk for scleroderma? Well, one question you would, might ask is, why should we do this? Well, the hope is that if we could figure out the genes, we might be able to figure out the proteins that are important, and that, this might give us new treatment targets, new uh, ways to treat the disease. It also might be able to better predict a patient's course. Uh, one of the things that has frustrated really almost every scleroderma patient that I've taken care of in rheumatology clinic is this unknown as to what's going to happen next. Well, if we better understand the genetics of scleroderma, perhaps we may be able to uh, take an individual patient and say, you are at risk for X, Y, or Z complication. In, it, in addition, it may be able to give an, uh, we may be able to give family members some idea of risk. So, how do we do uh, genetic studies now that we understand what the problem is and we understand what a gene is? We should also appreciate that there's over 20,000 genes in the human genome. So there's, by cor correspondingly, over 20,000 different proteins in our body. And across our genome, the term genome means all the genes in our body, uh, there are over 2 million tiny differences which we call, or changes in the genetic code, which we call polymorphisms. And some of these changes in the genetic code, called polymorphisms, will actually affect gene function. So how do we actually systematically test the genetic variation for its role in the disease process? Well, we do this by a, uh, a process called genetic association studies. And the way this works is you take a group of patients and a group of controls, so unaffected people, and you go you, using very modern technology called um, genotyping. You assess all the different polymorphisms in their genome. Then you ask which of these two million polymorphisms are under or overrepresented in patients. And the genes that these polymorphisms are in are then considered to be risk alleles or risk genes. Shown here is a schematic of how this type of study might be done for a single gene. So here on the left, you see a group of patients, and on the right, a group of controls people that are unaffected. If, for example, we think that gene X here, I'm just using a, this is just a, not a, a specific gene, but just an example of, of any particular gene. If gene X comes in two flavors, a type A and a type B, if we look at the patients and we see that more patients have the type B gene X, whereas more patient, more of the control patients have the type A, for example, here, 7 out of 13 patients have this type B gene X, whereas only 2 out of 13 of the controls have type B. We can say that the uh, type B gene X is a risk gene for scleroderma. So let's take a look at how specifically these scleroderma genetic association studies have been done. Now, there's two ways to do these studies. One is called a candidate gene approach, 
And the second approach is called a genome-wide approach. In the candidate gene approach, what the researcher does is that they say, well, we think these genes are involved. We think this particular gene is likely to be involved in scleroderma. They then go in to patients and controls and look at the polymorphisms or the changes in the genetic code for that particular gene and ask, are there differences in the patients with scleroderma versus the controls? Now, the pros for this approach is that because you're checking genes that you think may be involved in scleroderma, there's a high probability of finding something. However, because you're biasing yourself and you're saying, well, we think we're just going to look at this particular gene that we think is involved in scleroderma, we, um, you might not find anything new. The second approach, the genome-wide approach, means you're checking every possible known polymorphism in the genome, so over 2 million now. And they have ways of doing this within a day in the laboratory, checking in an individual person all their polymorphisms across all of their genes. Well, the pros of this approach is that there's a high probability of finding something new. However, these studies require huge numbers of patients. One of the studies I'll tell you about today uh, had 2,500 patients. And in addition, by checking everything, you can get what we call in science false positives, meaning a promising result that when another scientist tries to repeat it, it doesn't repeat. So let's provide a specific example of the candidate gene approach and a specific example of the genome-wide approach. Shown here are two genes, TBX21, and another gene called STAT4. Now, the names of the genes are not important for you to remember, but what's important to understand is that a great deal of science had shown that these two genes, TBX21 and STAT4, were important in controlling the balance of the immune response, uh, the, the control, controlling the balance of the immune response of fibrosis versus inflammation or scar tissue formation versus inflammation. So a few years ago, researchers at the University of Texas asked the question, are polymorphisms in the genes for the, these, two, uh, for these two genes, TBX21 and STAT4, are polymorphisms in those genes associated with the development of scleroderma? And what they found in their publication that came out in 2009 was that indeed changes in the genetic code in TBX21 as well as STAT4 were important or contributed to the risk of developing scleroderma. In other words, there was a particular polymorphism in both of, in both of these genes that was present at higher frequency in patients with scleroderma. Shown here is an example of a, the, the finding, a finding from using the genome-wide approach. So this is a, uh, a complicated graph here, so let me walk you through it. We call this, in genetics, a Manhattan plot. And I think you can appreciate how the plot here looks like almost like the skyline of Manhattan with different skyscrapers, each one of these peaks representing a skyscraper. What's on the x-axis here is all of the different chromosomes in our bodies, chromosomes 1 through 22, and then the sex chromosome, chromosome X. On the y-axis here is the genetic risk score. So when you see a peak here, it indicates that there's something about this region in this chromosome that is contributing to the genetic risk of developing scleroderma. One of the regions that was the strongest, the strongest region uh, for uh, contributing to the development of scleroderma was a region on chromosome 6 called the HLA region. Now, a great deal of research had documented that the HLA region is the master control region of the human immune system. This confirmed a role for the immune system 
in scleroderma. Not a trivial finding in that uh, it had been debated for many years whether the abnormalities in the immune system in scleroderma were a cause or effect of the disease. These data would suggest that changes in the immune system are a cause. Furthermore, in this paper, in this genome-wide approach, they also found polymorphisms in STAT4 were associated with the development of scleroderma. Lastly, they also found a new gene that's associated with the risk of scleroderma called CD247. CD247 is also a gene that controls the balance of the immune system. So what have we learned from these genetics association studies? I think we've learned that the immune system is important for the development of scleroderma, and we've identified some new potential targets, CD247, for example. In, time, in other um, studies that I didn't have time to show you today, polymorphisms in genes that control fibrosis or scar tissue formation, as well as uh, controls the, the health of blood vessels, were also shown to be important for the development of scleroderma. So where do we go with this information? Well, we can use this information to guide animal model experiments, and I'd like you to remember this for later, as I will show you a specific example of how that's been used. And then what we would like to do is figure out how these polymorphisms affect gene function, how they can affect disease severity, and eventually figure out how all of these different polymorphisms in any given patient work together to cause or to contribute to the patient's particular uh, unique disease. So let's move on to tool number two called gene expression profiling. So what is gene expression? So you've all seen this slide before. Remember I told you that the proteins in our body are encoded for by genes in our DNA, and that to make these proteins, DNA needs to be transcribed into this RNA intermediate. It's a segment of the DNA that corresponds, that contains the information to make one protein. And it's important to understand that different cells, tissues, and organs express different genes to make unique proteins to execute unique functions. In other words, the genes that a, uh, a red blood cell needs to express to carry out its function are not the same as the genes that your liver might need to, uh, to execute its function or the kidney to execute its function of helping to clean the blood. So and I've given this example before of hemoglobin in a red blood cell. So different cells, tissues, and organs express these different genes to make these unique functions. Now, it's important to understand that when you have a disease state, gene expression will change. And by identifying such changes in, disease, in gene expression, we can better understand the disease process. We may be able to identify subsets of patients based upon the particular genes that are being expressed in those patients, and then hopefully identify new targets for treatment. These types of experiments are what we call gene expression profiling. And let me walk you through how these particular types of experiments are performed. So the way these experiments are performed uh, is we take patients with different forms of disease. Here, for example, I'm showing localized, limited, and diffuse scleroderma, as well as patient, uh, people who are unaffected. We then do a biopsy of the skin, for example, of the patients and the controls. And shown here is just a picture of how a skin biopsy might look on a histology slide. We then isolate from the biopsies, the RNA, that intermediate between the gene and the protein. And we compare them. We compare the RNA expression in the controls versus the patients.
Now, as I had told you before, there are more than 20,000 genes. So how can we possibly look at expression of each one of these? And the answer is using an, a state-of-the-art technology, which we call microarrays. Let me tell you what a microarray is. So microarrays are also called, you may have heard this term, gene chips. Essentially what it is, is it's a chip where you take your RNA sample and you put it on this chip here. And on this chip are essentially 20,000 little tiny wells. Too, so small you need a microscope to see them. And each one of these wells on this chip has the ability to detect one single gene. And if you blow it up, if you blow it up, you can see um, how the genes are expressed. So for example, if it's bright red here, that means the gene expression is high. If it's green here, that means the gene expression is low. And if it's dark, that means that there's no gene expression for that particular gene. So the amount of signal tells you how much of that gene is expressed. So when this experiment was done comparing the gene expression in patients versus controls, what did we learn? Shown here is an example of how the, the data looks uh, when we analyze these gene expression studies. So shown here, this is called a heat map because where things are highly expressed, you see red. Each column here, and there are about a thousand columns, represents a single gene. And each row here represents an individual patient. And what you can see, the, the sort of 40,000 foot view, is that these particular patients have high expression of these genes. These patients have high expression of these genes. So there are subsets of patients at the gene expression level. I'll tell you about two of these subsets. One is subset that's been called the proliferation subset. This subset of patients has high expression of genes involved in cell growth and appears to be driven by a molecule that's called TGF-beta or transforming growth factor beta. TGF-beta is a molecule that can cause cell proliferation as well as fibrosis, usually in the absence of significant inflammation. The second subset, which is this group of patients, has high expression of genes involved in inflammation and hence has been called the inflammation subset. This subset of patients appears to be driven by a different molecule, different than TGF-beta, called IL-13 or interleukin-13. So what have we learned from the gene expression studies? Well, we've learned that there are different subsets of patients. And interestingly, the different subsets of patients at the gene expression level does not correlate perfectly with the differences in clinical disease subtypes. So for example, there are patients with diffuse scleroderma that fall into, moving back one slide, that fall into the inflammatory subgroup and some patients that fall into the proliferation subgroup. The proliferation subgroup um, may be due, may be, uh, is a, seems to be associated with overactivation of TGF-beta, and the inflammation subgroup seems to be associated with overactivation of interleukin-13. So perhaps if we could find a way to better subset patients at the point of care, we might be able to uh, tailor treatments if we can develop treatments against these molecules to those particular patients. So let's move on to the third tool, the animal model tool. So what are animal models? Simply, animal models are an attempt to mimic a human disease in an animal. In an animal. Oh, why do we use animal models? Well, we like to think that we use them to study the context, uh, to study the disease in the context of an entire organism. We like, we use it to identify potential new treatments as well as to test possible treatments. Shown here 
are the different animal models that are available for scleroderma at this time. Now, remember one of the things that we talked about early on today in the webinar was that scleroderma involves a number of disease features, including blood vessel abnormalities called vasculopathy, fibrosis or um, scar tissue formation, inflammation, as well as autoimmunity. And there's no single animal model that really can recapitulate all of these different features. We focus in our laboratory on two models, the bleomycin-induced skin fibrosis and a model called the SCL-GVHD, or sclerodermatous graft-versus-host disease model, that recapitulates three of the four features. All of these models are mouse models, except for this model called the UCD200 model, which is actually a genetic uh, disease in a particular group of chickens that develop a scleroderma-like illness with many of the features of scleroderma. So let me take you through a couple of experiments that we've done in the laboratory. So the bleomycin-induced scleroderma model came as an outgrowth of a clinical observation that patients that had received bleomycin, which is a chemotherapeutic that had received bleomycin for cancer treatment, developed a scleroderma, or some of them developed a scleroderma-like disease with lung fibrosis, skin fibrosis, as well as Raynaud's phenomenon. A number of years ago, a group developed a model of bleomycin-induced scleroderma by showing that if you injected mice under the skin with bleomycin, they would develop inflammation, an increase in the two, two of the molecules that I told you about already, interleukin-13 and TGF-beta, which can promote fibrosis, and then skin thickening with extra collagen that pathologically resembles scleroderma. Now, remember before I told you that polymorphisms or changes in the genetic code of TBX21 were associated with the risk of developing scleroderma. So a few years ago in the laboratory, we asked the question, well, what would happen if we did the bleomycin model of scleroderma in mice that had a mutation in their gene for TBX21? which in the mouse is called TBET. So this is an example of how the genetics can be used to inform the animal model experiments that we do. And let me take you through our results. What we found was that if we took wild-type mice, so these are normal mice, if we inject them with bleomycin, and then after a month, look at the amount of fibrosis in their skin, there's an increase. Compare this with this. This is just the amount of fibrosis if you just inject saline, or the background. However, if we take mice that lack TBET, there is an increase in the amount of fibrosis, suggesting that TBET is actually a repressor of fibrosis, such that when you lack TBET, you develop more fibrosis. But why is this happening? Well, from other research that had come out around the same time, it had been shown that TBET was a repressor or was able to block the activity of interleukin-13, which would slow down fibrosis. So we came up with the hypothesis that if in the absence of TBET, perhaps there's more interleukin-13 leading to our observation of more fibrosis in this particular model. What we would then hypothesize is that if we had a, had a mouse that lacked both TBET and interleukin-13, we should no longer have fibrosis. And that is indeed what we found. So shown here, again, these are the normal mice. If they're treated with bleomycin, they have an increase in their fibrosis. However, mice that lack interleukin-13 or mice that lack interleukin-13 and TBET, remember the TBET knockouts had an increase, so they would be way up here 
all these mice were completely protected from fibrosis induced by bleomycin. The second model that we've used is the chronic graft versus host disease model. This is a complication. So graft versus host disease is a complication of bone marrow transplantation in humans and has a also, like the bleomycin, like bleomycin, clinically resembles scleroderma. So we use a mouse model of chronic graft-versus-host disease that resembles scleroderma. And let me just show you a picture of how this might look on histology. So shown here is a picture of normal human skin, and this is a picture of mouse normal skin. And you can see that these little pink lines here are collagen bundles. And they're loosely, uh, so they're sort of loosely packed. However, in a patient with scleroderma or in our mouse model, the, the collagen becomes very, very tightly packed. And that's what gives the skin its hard feel in the scleroderma patients as well as in the mouse model. So these diseases look similar. But actually, are they similar? To answer this question, we used gene expression profiling, which you should be familiar with now. Essentially, what we did was we took mice that were affected with the GVHD or mice that were unaffected, found the genes by microarrays that were differently expressed, and then asked, are those genes that are differently expressed in the mouse model are those genes also differently expressed in human scleroderma patients compared to controls? And our conclusion from our study was that the genes in this particular animal model are overexpressed in the inflammation subgroup that I told you about earlier, but not the proliferation subgroup. So what this would suggest was that this particular animal model is capable of teaching us about the one, that one particular patient subset. And given how heterogeneous or different scleroderma is patient to patient, uh, perhaps really that's what we should be doing with our animal models in terms of looking to see which of the subsets of patients they best represent. And what I'll do is just in the last uh, data slide here, just show you uh, what happened when we performed our graft versus host disease model in mice lacking the ability to respond to interleukin-13. Remember I told you before that the inflammation subgroup seems to have overactivation of interleukin-13. Well, when we perform our model in mice lacking interleukin-13 receptor or the ability to respond to interleukin-13, there's protection from disease. So this is normal skin on the left. In the middle, you see skin from a GVHD mouse, and you can see here in the, what we call the dermis, this packing of coll packed collagen, and that's reversed when we do the experiment in mice lacking the ability to respond to interleukin-13. So this would suggest that the model of SCL-GVHD, like the bleomycin model, also depends on interleukin-13. So, what do we learn from these studies? Animal models are an attempt to mimic human disease. And we, want, we can try to learn about disease using our animal models as well as test hypotheses. For example, what's the role of interleukin-13? And perhaps in the inflammation subgroup, interleukin-13 uh, targeted therapy could help patients. So let's review quickly. We've gone over the challenge of scleroderma. We've talked about how complex the disease is with different clinical types. We've talked about how each patient is unique. We've gone over human genetics, gene expression profiling, and animal models as tools that we use to study scleroderma. We've gone over specific examples of how human genetics, the gene expression profiling, and animal models have been used to teach us about this condition. And I think with that, uh, I will close and just acknowledge uh, collaborators at Harvard, uh, Dr. Glimsher 
as well as Matt Greenblatt, a student and postdoc who's currently working with me on scleroderma projects, our collaborators at Boston Medical Center and Dartmouth, as well as thank the Scleroderma Research Foundation for their continued support over the last uh, six or seven years, as well as for uh, the invitation to speak today. And then, of course, thank you, thank the pa patients for the, their support and inspiration over the years. Um, it's really critical, as well as uh, thank patients for uh, participating in studies uh, that we've done that w without their participation would be impossible. And thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to answer questions. Uh, Tony, that's, that's really terrific. It's a great presentation, and I hope it does start to frame both some of the challenges and the opportunities for, um, for our audience today. Um, so we have a, about 15 minutes left, and we'd be delighted to field questions from the audience. And we, we have a couple. And, um, and I'll go ahead and, and editorialize a little bit um, just to sort of try and uh, if you will prime the pump. Um, but um, I think there's, it, there's a lot of confusion about whether scleroderma is a genetic disease or not, and I think you, you started to address that issue. Mm -hmm. Can you maybe just um, fill in a little bit more? What can people expect about scleroderma as a genetic disease? On the one hand, we talked about it as a research tool. How worried should people be about whether or not they're passing, you know, they, if they've got scleroderma, how likely is it for their children to have it? And maybe vice versa, did their, you know, did it get passed down? And if so, you know, was there scleroderma that was never diagnosed? Just maybe we could, you know, sort of bring that down to uh, sort of a layperson's level, if you could. Sure, uh, absolutely. Um, so when we think about genetic diseases, uh, we need to categorize them, I think, into two broad categories. Uh, one is a genetic disease that is what we call, what I would think would be directly transmissible. In other words, um, if a parent or sibling had it, you're highly likely to uh, develop that condition or almost will definitely develop it. Uh, the other category is where your genetics are playing a role in, in changing the, your, the absolute risk that you might have for developing uh, a, a particular disease. And scleroderma really falls into that second category where there's a increase in risk if you have a family member, a first degree relative, that would mean a sibling or a parent that had scleroderma, you're at increased risk, but your overall risk is relative, is low. In other words, and I think the number that I quoted on the slide, or the earlier slide, was that if you have a first degree relative, your chance of developing scleroderma is probably less than 2% which means less than 1 in 50. So if, you had, if a scleroderma patient had 50 siblings, chances are one would have scleroderma. However, since scleroderma is such a rare disease, that's still an increased risk compared to the general population. So I would say that there is an increased risk, but the absolute, or the, the, the chance that actually any individual person is going to have it if they have a family member with scleroderma is still quite low. Does that make sense, Luke? Yeah, sure. So maybe another way to phrase it, so the, the constellation of genes that you have uh, you know, sets a framework for whether or not you are more or less likely as compared to the average person to get scleroderma. And the fact that you have affected relatives suggests that you, have, you may have genes that make you a little bit more likely for something, uh, some other event to happen than that would get you, that would lead you down the path of scleroderma. Is that a, another way to phrase it? Yeah, I think that that's a, that's a very good way to phrase it. Um, one question that's come up, I think it's, a, it's really uh, interesting, is to talk a little bit about, let's say, the path from your IL-13 discovery, or, you know, even want to focus more generally, because there are therapeutics now for, say, uh, interf against interferon alpha, but just talk a little bit about the path from the, the research that we're doing to the clinic, if you will, sort of very translational and, um, you know, what are the steps and if you could give some idea of the time frame to, for involved in that. Mm -hmm. So in terms of uh, 
you know, developing this from the from the laboratory to uh, to patients, I think uh, you know what we need to do is we need to um, start by documenting that these uh, particular pathways are active in uh, in particular uh, patient subsets. And I think we've started to do that with the interleukin-13 pathway in these uh, inflammation, uh, in the inflammation uh, subgroups. We then uh, need to uh, develop a, an inhibitor of the, that particular pathway. And for interleukin-13, uh, one of the disadvantages is that uh, there have been some pharmaceutical companies that have developed uh, molecules that will that are capable of or designed to block interleukin-13 and they've developed it for other uh, for other conditions I think the you know the next steps in terms of we were trying to, if we're going to try to move this uh, to patients would be uh, to see if we could uh, generate interest in um, you know partnering with uh, someone who, or a company that might be interested in, in, in bringing this into uh, scleroderma patients. Does that make sense, Luke? Yeah, I actually, my understanding, Tony, you may know better, is um, that uh, roche has an anti-IL-13 reagent, and um, I think they are seriously considering launching Yeah, and, and so does, uh, uh, so does uh, Sanofi, I think. So I, I actually think so, just to sort of, help tie some of these strands together. Um, some of the basic work that, uh, that was done in, to link um, IL-13 blockade with um, a lessening of the symptoms and the, frankly, the, uh, the fibrosis in scleroderma laid the foundation for those pharmaceutical companies who were developing those anti-IL-13 reagents uh, and other diseases to think about applying that same reagent to treat scleroderma. And I think those trials are, you know, either being planned or are just about to be initiated. So I think it's, frankly, a, a great demonstration of how basic research can be translated, if you want, on an expedited basis um, into potential therapies. It, it does take a really long time if we had to start from scratch and develop the anti-IL-13 reagent uh, from scratch. That, that takes you know, many, many years. Right. And the fact that it has been, uh, has been tested um, makes, I think, it more, um, you know, at least in other types of, uh, in other patient sub subtypes or other diseases, um, that it's already been used would make the path a little bit, uh, the path forward more, um, more clear and, and easier, I think. Um, let's see. Um, do we, maybe we could just go back and talk a little bit about microarrays, uh, Tony, and, and, and talk about that as um, a way to, um, and talk a little bit about how that is being translated with your animal models. I, I thought some of the work that you've done in trying to take the human work on microarrays and um, examine the animal models for relevancy was was particularly informative. And maybe we could just spend a couple more minutes on on that and amplify some of the remarks you made. Sure. So, is it possible to jump back to another slide, to the slides? Yes, go right ahead. Let's see. Okay. So, I am now on slide 78. So, one of the uh, challenges when we think about using an animal model in uh, an animal model of a human disease is whether or not the animal model actually just happens to look like the disease at the surface, but the underlying pathways may not be uh, the same. And so you could study an animal model of a disease for years, but not really learn anything about the disease. So what we tried to do was we used our graft versus host disease model and used the microarray technology to ask the question, are the the genes that are being expressed in the animal model, uh, are they the same or different than the genes that are expressed in the skin of scleroderma patients? And so the way we did that was we took samples from mice that were affected uh, 
and samples from mice that were unaffected and ran microarrays to, to find the genes that were up or upregulated or had increased expression in the animal model. And then we compared that across all of the different scleroderma, compared that across scleroderma patients. We asked, are those genes that are up in the animal model, are they also up in particular patients? And our finding from that study was that the animal model represented a, the, this inflammation subgroup, the, a particular subgroup of patients that have uh, upregulation or high expression of inflammation genes. So what we think is that you know, this allows us to say, okay, well, now the studies that we're doing on their animal model, on this particular animal model, may be more relevant for this particular patient subset. And you, know, you might ask, how would that then be relevant? Well, if, for example, a therapy targeting interleukin-13 worked in the animal model, that might suggest that that interleukin-13 therapy should be targeted to patients that fall into this inflammation subgroup. And I know one of the other, our collaborator, Mike Whitfield, also a Scleroderma Research Foundation investigator, uh, is working on ways to be able to take an individual patient and at the point of care, subset them and say, you fall into the inflammation subgroup or you fall into the, uh, the proliferation subgroup. So if we could be able to do that at the point of care, we may be then able to, as we develop these therapies, we may be able to then target it to the right patient subgroup. Great. Um, may, Tony, do you want to talk a little bit more, maybe, just, maybe one more uh, minute or so, and then we're going to wrap up, but just maybe some future directions, uh, just a little bit of speculation about where we, you know, where your research might be going in the next uh, year or two and try and help people understand how, you know, how this might, you know, have, a, have an impact in another couple of years. Mm -hmm. So uh, my research is we're doing a couple of different things. Uh, one is we're trying to develop uh, a version of the uh, mouse graft versus host disease model that instead of being completely dependent on mouse cells actually is dependent upon human cells being transferred into the mouse. Now the advantage of this type of system would be we could directly test therapeutics targeting uh, the hu human cells. We then are also looking at the, we like to figure out a couple of things related to the interleukin-13 pathway. Uh, we'd like to figure out what are the particular cells in the body that make interleukin-13 because it's becoming apparent that another way to treat diseases is not just to inhibit, for example, a particular protein, but actually by depleting out the particular um, cells that are responsible for causing disease. So we think if we can understand what cells are making into interleukin-13, we may be able to devise a strategy to delete those cells in our models first, but then in patients, and then perhaps uh, that could be a treatment for scleroderma. And then we're also trying to figure out what are the uh, relevant um, pathways that are driving cells to make interleukin-13 to try and uh, where I see my research fitting in is in, in identifying the pathways that, um, that, identifying the pathways that should be targeted. And we're doing that uh, around interleukin-13. And I think, you know, sort of more broadly, uh, I think the field is, uh, is working toward um, kind of developing a, a broader understanding as to how the different animal models uh, are re relate to both the different clinical subtypes of scleroderma as well as the different molecular or gene expression subtypes that I told you about so that we can start studying uh, 
uh, studying the disease from, uh, I guess, at a more sophisticated level, where when we're using our animal models, we're know, we know which particular patient subset it may relate back to. Great. That is really helpful. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tony. And I'd also like to thank everyone for joining us today and participating in, uh, in this, our third webinar. Uh, just as a point of information, when you close the window, you can provide some really valuable feedback for us. Um, and we, as I said in my opening remarks, we very much appreciate it, your feedback and, and your thoughts and opinions. Of course, you can always email us directly um, at www.sclerodermresearch.org. And of course, call the office anytime, 1-800-441-CURE. Thank you, Dr. Laprontis. Um, Thanks, the Luke. The presentation has been, been really clear. I, um, I certainly got something out of it, and I hope everyone else uh, enjoyed it as much as I did. As a reminder, today's uh, webinar will be available for download beginning sometime next week right off of the SRF website. For more information or to read more about current research and news in the scleroderm community, please visit our website. And as I and, and as I mentioned earlier, we depend solely on your support to continue our research funding, and we very much appreciate your generosity. Our next webinar is scheduled for 11 a.m. Pacific on Wednesday, April 25th, and it will feature Dr. Fred Wigley, a rheumatologist and the director of the Johns Hopkins Scleroderma Center, one of the largest and the most respected scleroderma clinics in the nation. You will receive an email uh, in, in the next week or so uh, which would enable you to register for this fourth in the series. This concludes our webinar. Thank you again. Bye-bye for now. Thank you. Please stand by.